when I look at IT, I look at communities. I look at the uh, application development community. I look at the, uh, uh, the uh, commercial off-the-shelf software, ERP, PLM, CRM market. I look at business intelligence. I look at business process management. I look at these various communities of specialties that are often have individual independent relationships with the customer and they're all competing for mind share and budget. So we have often heard the phrase aligning business and IT. How many of us have heard that phrase at least a hundred times? Okay. How do we align business with IT until we align IT with itself? Okay, that's a question I'd like to po pose. How do we get all these players playing on the same team at the same cadence focused on what the customer wants. This is one of, I think, the big challenges. Because each of these communities up here, there's somebody out there blogging right now that puts lean in front of each of these. Lean business intelligence, lean service management, lean ERP, okay? Well, what's lean if not looking at the whole? So let's talk about how we get there from here I think we all realize that most organizations are spending the majority of their spend their investment and their consumption dollars on just running the business keeping the lights on but how about growing the business how about doing new stuff and let's get really radical and say let's do radically new disruptive stuff that will make new markets and new products and new customers and this is what the CIO is being asked by the CEO these days. What they're basically saying is 80-20 is not acceptable. And depending on the various sources, you'll get some version of this, where if we're spending 80% of our annual spend just keeping the lights on, that leaves 20% to grow and innovate. And, and th that doesn't make sense to me. I don't think it makes sense to anybody. I think I'd be happy with 50-50. Let's start there and see if we can't get past that. Well, how do we get there? Well, first of all, let's go from 80 to 50% by talking operational excellence. Let's take our consumption of IT services down by becoming more efficient. And let's try then do that with outsourcing our IT operations. Because I think we all know from the lesson in manufacturing, did we really benefit as much as we thought we would when we outsourced manufacturing to China 10, 20 years ago? Did it really work that way? Okay. I'm not saying that there aren't arguments why we should anyways, but let's try it internally first. Because if we don't achieve operational excellence internally in our IT operations, all we're doing is outsourcing a big ball of mud. And what happens when you outsource a big ball of mud? Okay, You might get there eventually, but it's going to cost you in the transition. Agile and Lean came mostly from different directions. It's hard to really un understand. I mean, Lean's been around in one form or another for 50, going on 60 years. And although the Agile Manifesto was written in about 2001, it had been going on for years. We're both drinking from the same well. Faster, smaller batches, level schedule, quality, engagement, and adaptive learning. Uh, anyone argue that any of these foundational principles aren't a core piece of both lean and agile. Okay? There's more to IT than agile, by the way, but why I'm focusing on agile is agile is the most mature instance of lean principles applied in the world of IT. I might, I might put ITIL 3 next on that list. But agile, there's a huge body of knowledge around agile. So how can lean thinking add value to agile? Well, um, I'm sorry Tom and Mary aren't here, but this is from their book several years ago. It's talking about the value stream, the whole value stream. If an organization focuses on optimizing something less than the entire value stream, we can just about guarantee that the overall value stream will suffer. Okay? What are they talking about? We have a value stream. We get requirements in here, and we get software comes out the other end. That's a value stream, right? Who's the customer? How about this one? Although Scrum, which is an agile project management methodology, may help teams isolate themselves from dysfunction in the organization, it is better for them to help the organization become more functional. Interesting. So I might argue that some agile teams become effective by building a moat and a, and a big wall around their teams to protect them from the craziness of demand 
And the uh, disagreeable, sometimes IT operation folks that don't ever want to make any changes happen, right? And so they sit in the middle and they churn out releases all day long, but how quickly are they adopted by the customer and how is the whole flow from value of the customer to the end customer receiving what they want? Often, even in a very well-skilled agile organization, doesn't always work that way. Sometimes it does. Okay, there's two cases here. You can have a traditional software development life cycle, the big waterfall projects. You have a lot of projects launched at once. You've got WIP, you've got congestion, you've got switching by constrained resources, inefficient, unpredictable. You could also have agile, which is, remember I talked about protection from erratic demand, but either way, whether you'd have a waterfall or an agile, and in many large organizations you have both. You know, some teams are a little ahead of the curve. Some have decided to go agile or V model or whatever, and others haven't. But in any case, if you have a perfectly operational agile that's running to these marching orders, is it going to work the way you want it to? So when the pop index say you have to look at the whole value stream, in my mind, this is what they were talking about here. And then let's talk about batch to release. Poor preparation and handoff to operations. This is where the DevOps comes in. Agile rapid releases meet the control change to prevent disruption. You have two things coming together and they're out of cycle. Especially the case when multiple software de uh, development life cycles converge on a single massive virtualized hosted infrastructure, when you've got like 10 or 20 project teams all feeding stuff that has to be queued up and integration tested with each other, you're creating a great big traffic jam. Does that make sense? Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't do it. There are definitely economies of scale to massive virtualization. But let's think for a minute about are there some values and economies of flow that might counterbalance the cost savings we'll get from putting all our servers in one place and having one mechanism to regulate it all. Okay, does that make sense? We might be creating problems for ourselves in other ways than the unit cost measurement of running these big server farms and these big virtualized environments. That's economy of flow thinking versus economy of scale. And then finally, adoption and value realization. This is the whole point. Until you get here, everything upstream is Muda. Until the user sits down and starts using it and saying, wow, I really like this. You woke up this morning and there were new features in Google. You don't know about it. You might have found them. You might not. If you find one, you might go, oh, that's cool. Or you might say, oh, that didn't work and never use it again. And they're tracking every click on every new thing they insert every day. And behaviorally, they're able to tell which things are discoverable and users like, and which ones are discoverable and users don't like. And you never know it. You don't get release notes from Google every morning, do you? Okay. So resistance, if users aren't involved in the whole life cycle, there's, there's a congestion point. You could do all this right, but if it lands on the user's desk and they're reluctant to adopt it, if they're not looking forward to it, when is it, when is it gonna get there? When can I start using it? That's a delay, that's waste. Here is what I would like to suggest this model might look like. Demand comes from various sources, users, customers, new regulatory requirements, a sudden merger acquisition that's announced. There's any number of things that cause sudden demand. And there's a portfolio queue, there's a backlog, and this is constantly being reprioritized because until this team, notice this is one team. This is a value stream comprised of the developers and the operations people so that when something is pulled into production, it flows at the pacemaker, at the rate of the pacemaker to delivery with no interruptions and no defects. That's flow. Now the beauty of this is if your flow, if your tack time is two weeks, every two weeks a pull signal is issued. And up until about a minute before that pull signal is issued, you can reshuffle the sequence, the release sequence in this queue, and it doesn't matter. 
Okay. Now you do have you have interdependencies, right? I mean, it's not that simple, but it is. The point is, if you really have flow and it's moving quickly and at a predictable rate, they don't care what this. The people who are deciding what's next, this that morning, somebody could have said, "Wow, we just had a customer request. Let's do it." Well, when's the next release cycle start? Uh, tomorrow. Okay, let's get it into the queue and let's release it tomorrow, and it'll be done in two weeks. Okay, does that make sense? So, and then the customers adopt it and realize the value, and the measurements, there has to be a check and adjust, feed back into your demand saying, did we estimate that right? Did we really know what the customer wanted? Was the value realized or not? And that's really important for us to make better decisions. Every time this cycle runs, our decisions, our estimating capability gets a little bit better. Okay? Now, has anybody been in a manufacturing environment and recognize what this is called? It's called Hejunka, H-E-I-J-U-N-K-A. This has been working in factories for years. Okay? And it's rarely electronic. Usually it's a post office box thing with the Kanban cards and slots. And the person who's the gatekeeper at the operation about to start the next flow in the manufacturing process walks over, picks up the next card in the slot and says, oh, that's what I'm going to work on next, and psh, off it goes. And that's effectively what we're dealing with here, level scheduling, where your prioritization is saved to the last minute. It's all very quick. And this, as far as I can tell, model was developed somewhat independently in the Agile world, uh, there had to have been some cross-fertilization somewhere, but it really works. And so what it does, it encourages continuous improvement because you have the PDCA cycle, which is rapid, and you have continuous innovation because now any new idea can be slipstreamed right in and out in the next release cycle. Have we dealt with the uncertainty factor? Have we dealt have we given ourselves a path to try things, to take new ideas that come out of the field and test them out and experiment with them? Maybe. I don't know. Let's try it. And Thank say, you very much. Thank you. Thank you.